Hello and good evening everyone and welcome to Scaling and Managing Node.js Applications with Microservices. My name is Adele and I head up the community team here at eSynergy Solutions. We specialize in open source and cloud resourcing. If you are looking for a new opportunity, we can help you find the right role tailored to your skills and experience on either a contract or permanent basis. So if you are looking for a new opportunity, please do send over your updated CV. Should you be looking to build out your team, we can help you with hiring and attracting top talent. Alongside this, we can also help you with upskilling your employees around the latest open source and cloud technologies. Now moving on to some housekeeping. If you have any questions for Armagon, please fire them over via the questions box throughout and he will answer them at the end of his talk. We are recording the session and the slides and recording will be made available and sent to you tomorrow by email along with my contact details. So now I'm going to pass you over to Armagon to begin the talk. We hope you enjoy the session. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you um, can hear me clearly. And I hope now you can see my screen, my presentation. And if there are any problems, please um, let us know in the comments and we'll try to figure out what the problem is. And um, thanks, Adele, for the introduction. And yeah, this is Armand speaking. And today I'm going to talk about scaling Node.js applications with uh, microservices architecture. Um, so before we begin, I would like to introduce myself. Um, I'm a software architect, a software craftsman who have designed and built software from scientific systems to desktop apps, mobile apps, and cloud services. Um, currently, I am the head of software engineering at UNU GmbH. Um, it's a Berlin-based mobile solutions company, and I lead the efforts on our cloud services and apps. I also have a voluntary initiative called Lonja Works, where we teach young CS graduates the art of software engineering through the practices of software craftsmanship. Um, there are a few open source projects that I also lead, uh, which you could find on GitHub. Uh, I'm also going to share this presentation afterwards, so you'll have it um, at your hand. And I have some hobby projects based on Web Audio API, which you could also check out if you're into guitars. Um, okay, now back to the topic. This talk is mainly about scaling Node.js applications. Obviously, Node.js is really great for asynchronous programming, and it really handles a lot of bottlenecks with um, IO by design, um, by its asynchronous design. While nearly all of our apps and web servers in Node.js run as daemons, they run as long-running processes, and usually they're, well, single process. Um, the problem with this approach is since it's a single process, a single entry point, it doesn't scale. It's a monolith, basically. And Node.js basically doesn't have enough infrastructure for proper threaded computation, and certainly scalability ends at the limit of your single machine's resources. Basically, you can scale up to the number of um, CPUs that you have on your machine. So Node.js works exactly uh, great um, as a single process, and there's a cluster module um, that helps you scale within a computer, which is OK. But the problem is it incurs tight coupling between your code and your scaling solution. And what happens next? What if you need more computing power? What if you need to scale beyond data centers? Um, you want to scale across geographical regions. Um, basically, it's not an easy task in Node.js applications. Um, the first solution that comes to mind is actually the reverse proxy. Um, we also know it as the load balancer. This is a typical pattern people have used for ages um, for scaling their applications, and we have um, two cool, um, two great tools that can help us here. One is Nginx, and the other is a library called Node HTTP Proxy. Um, today we're going to talk about Nginx, of course. Uh, basically, what you have is you have copies of your application servers running on different machines, um, and then you have a single load balancer, Nginx installation, in front of them, 
and your clients basically connect to um, these application servers through your reverse proxy. Um, so they only connect to, for example, um, eBay.com, and then there's a reverse proxy server in between that um, catches all those requests and forwards those requests to different application servers um, in order to basically balance the load um, between these here four servers. Um, now, Nginx is a great solution here in terms of a load balancer, uh, but this is quite ineffective, and I believe actually that is why you are here with me in this webinar. The problem is all of these servers run an, um, an instance of a single application, which is a monolith, uh, which is a single code base, single deployment, um, and single instance, um, single process application. Um, the problem with monoliths is that it gets too big to manage effectively. Um, that is um, actually a summary that we can give. So um, it's obvious that we need a different solution because in monoliths, bugs occur in every corner of your code base, and then they crash. They take down the whole app with um, with the bug and. Most probably, your app would have different functions such as, for example, payments, account management, uh, profiles, orders, a catalog of your services, and more um, stuff. All of these have different loads and different scaling needs, um, but the problem is you can separate them within a monolith. So you deploy a monolith as a single unit to a server, and even if you wanted to scale only the payments function, for example, you would have to bring in all the other stuff with you, all the user profiles and catalog stuff. This would actually uh, mean excessive baggage. You have to allocate a lot more resources than what you actually need, and it just sucks to maintain high availability in this scenario um, because now you have lots of redundant servers um, with the same problems that uh, occur in a single server scenario and then you have multiple of them. So obviously we now know that there are two approaches to this architecture of scaling our apps. One is the uh, monolithic application approach and the other one is the um, service oriented architecture and it's redefined as microservices. I don't want to say it's rebranded. Uh, there are some differences between simple service-oriented architecture and microservices. Um, but yeah, this is the um, second solution that you can uh, basically build within your apps. Um, now, I'm not going to try to talk you into microservices. I believe you're here because you already have a buy-in about microservices and you want to hear about them more. Um, so I'm just going to uh, skip the benefits of microservices and skip to the um, juicy parts, um, which are basically the problems, the problems that you face with microservices. Um, since your application will be broken into maybe hundreds of services, the strategy you choose for communication, whether it's JSON over HTTP or Thrift or another solution, is extremely important. Um, if you want to do transactions, for example, for payments, um, in a monolith, you would be able to do it within your uh, code base locally um, because everything happens in a single server. Um, probably you won't have transactions um, with your microservices approach, and that means you have to implement distributed transactions, which is totally on you. And no software will solve it, solve it for you. No software will solve the problem for you. Basically, if you want to have distributed transactions, you have to have that logic specifically in your app, uh, and that means, obviously, the rollback mechanism, too. Um, another problem is, since you have a lot of servers and services, new services will be introduced maybe weekly, and the configuration of um, some other services will change. Um, maybe even on a daily basis because you will need to scale very dynamically and it means some services will basically um, change places uh, between servers. So they, their IP addresses will change, their ports may change, and you have to cope with this. 
Um, that means you need a mechanism a registry that is constantly updated for your services to discover each other so that they can uh, basically communicate. Um, another problem is you need to monitor your services closely because a typical customer request would probably go through several request stages, several services um, in order to be uh, fulfilled. So if say, um, let's say you're doing a payment request and probably with a credit card, you need to validate the credit card and then um, you need to make sure the actual payment transaction occurs with the bank. Uh, you need to update your stock, you need to update your um, customer's profile uh, for the actual purchase and then um, respond the, to the actual uh, request that is sent by the customer. Um, so you will have maybe five, six, or maybe even more services um, in place in order to respond to a request. So this is a little bit problematic because you need um, solid health checks. You have to make sure that the path to successfully process that request is open. Um, and it means a lot more than your regular um, than your regular monitoring um, of servers, for example, with CPU and memory. It also means that you have to have health checks of your servers um, running in real time so that um, if there's a problem, you're notified instantly. So this is roughly the problem space that we're trying to solve. It is actually just scratching the surface, but these are some of the fundamental problems that we face. Um, and we have solutions for, for some of these problems. So one topic is Nginx in this presentation. It can act as a um, service that is a, an interface for our microservices. So let's um, see how it could help us in this case. Um, previously, we saw that we could use Nginx as a load balancer before our um, replicated application servers, which are basically monolith. Um, it's actually a very good use case, and uh, a lot of people run their applications like that um, currently. But Nginx configuration is actually very good, and it's very declarative. So you can basically use it as the coordinator between your services. Now, I'm not talking about a client-facing load balancer here, um, like in the previous graph that I showed you. I'm talking about using Nginx as an internal service that helps you coordinate communication between each service. That is basically a service discovery tool. Um, and it helps your services discover other services around them. For example, you would have a payment service and it would require to connect to a um, credit card validation service. And you basically need a URL for that if you're building uh, your microservices on top of HTTP. So um, Nginx can be configured in this way to help you um, discover these services. And the good thing is it can also do load balancing. So you could launch many instances for a service and use Nginx as a reverse proxy before them. Um, and basically they will be opaque to the consuming service. So let's say you have five credit card validator services uh, which run in parallel and an Nginx before them, of course, as the uh, coordinator. And then you have the payment service which is trying to access the card validation service. In this scenario, Nginx will basically load balance your requests between all those um, services of, or all those microservices. And um, the only information that the payment service needs is actually the URL or a nickname, let's say, of the um, available services um, of card validation. Um, so the problem there is in order to achieve this functionality, you need to be able to update the configuration of your Nginx installation whenever a new service is available. Um, because as I said before, the configuration is changing dynamically. So you need basically um, a way to update your Nginx configuration in probably real time um, so that new services are discovered. And when services change places in 
servers, your uh, consumer services are notified of the change and uh, basically your service can uh, continue to work as um, intended. Um, so this problem is best solved with a service registry, which is basically a database of your available services. It contains records of um, service names and their IP addresses and their port numbers. Um, so, for example, if the payment service is looking for a specific payment provider service or a card validation service um, that goes by the name of, let's say, credit card validator, um, Nginx should know where this credit card validator service lives. Um, it should know its IP address and port so that it can forward your requests. Um, so there should be a registry to keep this information. And if you can update the configuration of your internal Nginx installation on any change in this registry, well, you have your service discovery problem already solved. Um, so now Docker is a great tool for um, maintaining um, your application installations in the cloud. Um, if you're not using containers when deploying your apps, you should probably start right now. Now we'll look at an example with um, Node.js. Um, the underlying system for this example is developed by Dr. Graham Jensen and it's called Diarcon. Um, so I have a link for you in this presentation which you can follow after, after the webinar and do it for yourself. Um, this example uses a service called console as a service registry. Um, it uses um, a registrator and console templates for updating whenever a service changes state and Nginx for service discovery and load balancing. Now, as I said before, we have an Nginx installation. Um, we have a console installation as service registry and we have the registrator that looks for Docker images. Um, so whenever they come online, whenever a new Docker uh, container is launched, the registrator gets its information and registers it in console database and then updates the Nginx configuration so that our services um, work together. First, let's have a look at um, look at the source code for um, our implementation. I hope you can see the source code. So um, the example comes with two practical services that uh, we need to build, obviously, with um, Node.js. I use Restify. And this will be, uh, the main transport will be HTTP and JSON. Um, this is a payment service which basically lets people pay by their credit card number. Now, of course, we're omitting a lot of details here like um, user authentication and even the amount itself, uh, but it's beyond the scope of this example. Um, here, what we're trying to do is uh, uh, whenever there is a request coming to um, this pay endpoint with a card number, uh, we should validate the credit card first and then um, execute the uh, payment scenario and complete it and return to the customer uh, with a successful um, payment. So the card validation service is actually implemented as another uh, microservice here. So how do we discover that? How do we know where that um, validation uh, service lives. The good thing is right now we need an IP address or a host name um, that points to that service and that's all. We don't need any, uh, any other information. Um, and then we just send the request to that uh, validation service and then um, get a call back of the answer. So how does validation service work? Um, it's also um, another RESTify server so that it can respond to HTTP requests. Um, I have to remind you that this validation server is not facing the client. Um, so the client, the customer is not actually 
accessing this validation server. Uh, what it does is basically it, it has an endpoint for validating credit card numbers, and then all it does here is send the status code 200, which means it's okay, it's validated. Um, so this is a microservice for validating credit cards, and it's listening on some ports, um, 880, um, and it actually doesn't matter on which port it listens because we will deploy it as a Docker container. And then we have another payment service, which is facing the client, facing the uh, consumers, um, so it has an endpoint of uh, payment, and it accesses this validation client from um, from the IP address. It also listens to 8080, um, another. Um, it's basically the same port, and it again doesn't matter uh, because these will basically be separate services that will live in Docker containers, and this basically means that you can deploy them to whatever um, machine that you want, and they will just work. So, how do these work in in parallel? Let's see. Uh, first, I need to launch my console installation, which is um, basically a registry of the services registered with it. So I have the registrator and um, the archon. They all live as Docker um, containers. So right now they're running on a virtual machine on my machine, uh, but basically you could run them anywhere uh, as long as you get the um, correct um, correct configuration. So we have a payment service and then we have a validation service and we will basically make requests to um, the payment service and see it validated within another, ser another service. Um, so here is the uh, command to run payment service. Again, let me go back to the source code. The only thing that I um, wrote here in this microservice is creating a server, a RESTify server, obviously, for interacting with the um, outside world, a client for um, the validation server, validation service, sorry, um, and then basically the handler, um, the handler which gets the card number from the request and um, asks the validation client if it's validated, if it's valid or not. So I run the payment service and you see it's listening at some internal port. And actually in console here we see that there is a payment service here and Basically, it's alive, it's well. So now Nginx knows about this payment service. And then, um, here I'm launching a validation service so that I'll be able to validate the requests. Um, it's again run as a Docker container. Um, I'm using an image available in Docker Hub called Node PM2. PM2 is a process manager for Node.js. And it's actually uh, pretty impressive. It can. Um, it basically replaces uh, Supervisor D for a lot of people. Um, it lets your um, node applications run, and it relaunches them whenever there's a bug, there's an error, or it can watch for file changes, and it can even do deployments for you. Um, so it's a pretty nifty tool that I would um, advise you to check out. I have a special image, um, a Docker image at um, Docker Hub for PM2. Basically, you um, attach a volume of your source code, and here is the directory, um, and indicate which uh, JavaScript file uh, you want it to run, and basically it runs it for you. Um, so this service name parameter here basically makes this validation service registered in our local Nginx installation. So now it's also online. And here we have payment service and validation service in our console registry. Now this is good. Um, this basically gives you an overview of your services. So you can basically track which services are online and obviously they're health checks. So let's say, okay, 
here's the query request to the endpoint of the uh, payment service. I'm trying to validate this 123456 card number and I get a validated result, which is good. Now you see, this is the payment service. It is um, trying to access this validation service here, and basically this validation service is validating the card number and sends it back. So this is all good, and you can run these in whatever um, machine you want, whatever data center you want. Um, so what happens when I want to um, scale my validation service because probably it's seeing a lot of load and let's say it's doing heavy calculations so it might need more resources and one service, one instance is not enough. Uh, there what I do is I just launch another instance of, um, of that validation service. And now you see there are two nodes for that validation service because I have basically two uh, validation services. Now what happens when I try to let's say validate a card, the first request is obviously they're, they're going through the payment service. The first request is going to um, the validation service that I launched earlier and the second request is going to the second service. Basically this is round robin. Uh, load balancing, and this is what Nginx uh, does for us. Um, so I could just launch more and more validation services, and they would all be registered right away, and payment service doesn't have to know the IP address, doesn't have to know the uh, port number of each validation service, and it just works. So you see one to the top and one to the bottom. Um, Yeah, this is about this is about scaling um, Node.js applications, and this is pretty much how you do it with with different services. Let's go back to the source code again. We had a payment service, uh, which had a RESTify client, a RESTify server uh, for the outside world. It allowed people to pay with credit card numbers and it basically forwarded that, that, that validation uh, responsibility to the validation service and the only configuration that we had to do here is an IP address but obviously um, in a real world scenario it would be changed by something like a validation service um, so that um, you are not bound to one IP address and that validation service would point to um, point to the um, internal load balancer, internal Nginx, but right now my internal Nginx is running um, on this IP address, so uh, I'm just using that one. Um, and yeah, you would obviously have uh, DNS records for that. So this is the only configuration, and then you can launch as many validation, um, as many validation services as you like, uh, and then basically um, you will have load balancing. Um, now this is a good scenario, and I already mentioned that you could have multiple um, multiple services for a payment request, and probably you would have uh, actual bank transaction service too. And what you would have here is after you validate the credit card, you basically hit that transaction service um, so that it does the monetary transaction for you. So how does Code.js come into play? Now if you have uh, listened to me carefully, I've talked about a lot of um, technologies that you need in order to satisfy the scenario of scaling um, Node.js applications. I talked about Docker, which you should have by default. Um, I talked about Nginx, which is a load balancer. I talked about um, console, a registry, a, a registrator, um, and something called the Archon, uh, which basically keeps um, this registration process updated in real time with your um, services. So this is a little bit uh, overwhelming for um, simple scenarios and it, it's basically, it basically gives you a lot of um, points of error 
what happens if you if your console um, deployment fails? You have to have that um, re have redundancy in your console implementation too. So the question is, can we get better at it? Can we get better at developing Node.js applications without actually having to configure all this all these other um, services? And the answer is yes, we can do it, and we can do it with Code.js. Code.js um, is a Node.js framework for building basically zero configuration applications that are scalable, that are fault tolerant, and that are by nature distributed. Um, so Code.js features auto discovery. So basically, your daemons don't have to, um, don't need a service registry. They just discover each other automatically. And the good thing is, in the previous example, in the first source code, the payment service needed the nickname of the validation service um, to be able to send it the requests. But what happens after some time you just decide to split that responsibility in the credit card validation service and then you want to change its name? Well, that would require you to go back to your payment service and then update the name of the client. Let me show it to you. So. We have an IP address, and I told you that it could be replaced with the nickname of the um, validation service. What happens if you want to change the uh, validation service name? You have to go back and update a lot of configuration, in, you know, even in your Docker deployments, um, to have that basically function. Um, and we want to avoid that problem by using auto discovery, um, which is a discovery mechanism that is working across all your daemons in, in real time. Basically, Code.js gives you a mesh network, peer-to-peer -peer communication, so any service that you launch can uh, talk to any other responding service as long as um, they, are, um, they have a central interface, they have a central communication um, platform. Um, so it supports pop-sub pattern, so you can have one, for example, payment service and then a logging service and probably you'll have hundreds of services and a few logging services. You could just publish uh, your logging messages and then they will be um, caught by all the logging servers. And for example, one could be uh, streaming it to another service, another online cloud provider. One could be just dumping them locally. Um, it also satisfies the request to responder pattern, which basically uh, we saw in the previous example. It's basically requesting something and getting, getting a response back. Um, it has client-side communication with WebSockets, uh, which means um, you don't have to do anything in order to um, implement a WebSocket implementation, and any client with um, enough authentication can talk to your uh, backend services. Uh, without doing any any special configuration. Um, it supports load balancing with different strategies. Round Robin is just one of them, and it has load-based or response time-based um, strategies that you can use. Um, so here's an example architecture. Let's say we have um, some clients here, as in the previous example. We, have, we can have a load balancer in front of them, um, in which case Nginx would be a good example. Um, it's it's just there basically to serve the WebSocket servers and to make them available uh, from a single uh, single point um, of, of access or, or a single URL. So we have some WebSocket servers, they are code components and we call them SOCKENDS and it basically stands for socket and uh, backend uh, because they work in the backend and um, they are gateway to our backend um, daemons. And then we could have requesters and we could have responders or we could have a publisher and subscribers. So here's an example of a request. Let's say the request is A and let's see where it goes. So it first hits the SOCAN components and let's say we want to publish this A message to an internal logging mechanism of different transports and we could have a publisher for that and some subscribers behind it um, to get that information. 
the publishing occurs once and then you can have as many subscribers as you want um, to handle that request. Um, and then for a request of type B, for example, um, both SOCAN components can of course serve it. Um, you would have some requesters uh, in the in the backend that would do the B request um, for the client, and some responders that would basically respond to those requesters. Now the good pattern here is you can basically have as many requesters and as many responders as you want. So if there's any problem here due to load, high load, you could just replicate these requesters and launch them wherever you want. And since this is a zero configuration framework, um, you'd basically um, be able to, they would be able to communicate with the responders and with the rest of the system without you requiring uh, to do any configuration at all. That goes the same for responders too. You could have as many responders as you like uh, without changing anything in the system and the requesters would automatically uh, know when a responder is online and be able to um, talk to them. Um, so here's a pops up implementation and I'm going to uh, uh, present a few more example implementations. Um, we instantiate a new publisher. We give it a name just in case this actually none of these are needed but it's good for uh, logging. Uh, when you want to log something, it's good to know which service is, goes by what name. Um, and you basically tell um, what message it broadcasts. Again, this is only for um, purposes of documentation and not for configuration. And basically this example publisher just publishes um, an update of a number um, with three second intervals. And then you have another subscriber. Um, we call them a subscriber. And basically on every update, that is the message here, on every update we basically um, log it um, to the console. Now we have a, an example e-commerce application in, that's available in GitHub. It basically goes through every um, every stage of um, a um, of an example e-commerce application. So it has a payment processor service, is a product catalog service, purchasing service, um, and user and account service. Um, so I think it's good if we first go through the basic steps of Code.js and then. Um, if we have time, we can we can look into um, the um, actual implementation of this e-commerce application. So let's go back to our payment scenario. We need a payment service and a validation service. Remember, we first implemented this with Nginx, um, and we had a Restify server and HTTP transport between um, basically two daemons, uh, two services, payments and validation services. Now, let's look at the source code of the code example. Here you have a server again, a RESTify server. This is for uh, the endpoint because this is basically what talks to um, the, the clients. It again uh, has an endpoint for payments. It gets the card number. It prepares a request of type validate and basically sends this request to the payment requester to get the to get the response back. Now, if you look carefully, there there's no configuration here at all other than the name of the payment requester, which is good for logging purposes. In a previous scenario, we had to hard code the name of the validation service or the IP or of the validation service, um, and I had mentioned that if it changed, if somebody changed there, basically you would go back to uh, your source code of this payment service and update the um, name or the IP address of that validation service. So since we have no configuration here, you don't need any of that. And here's the best part. The validation service is totally devoid of configuration. Again, and 
you just focus on what this service delivers. It delivers answers for validation requests. And basically right now it's only doing um, logging. So it prints the card number to the console and then um, it lets the callback know that like the validation went through without any problems. So in comparison, here's the actual um, validation service that we, we used for um, serving HTTP requests. The important thing here is this validation service has to listen to an explicit port. And if you're not using Docker, um, then that would mean that you have to manually increment this port number here for different services because obviously they would clash on, on a given port. And if you're using Code.js, you're not doing anything at all. You're just launching a responder and it basically responds to validate requests. Now, let's see this in action. First, I'm just terminating the other example. And yeah. Now again, I'm gonna use the same um, Docker image of Node PM2 uh, because obviously I like it a lot and I use it a lot in production. Um, so here we are running the Code.js example and here we have the payment service. It's good. Hello, I'm a payment requester and there's a um, unique ID that you can track between your logs. Um, and then here's a validation service. It's good. Hello, I'm a validation responder. Now it basically sees the uh, payment requester and you immediately see that payment requester um, found somewhat an open port and just registered itself there. Um, and it basically discovers the payment service automatically. Now you have to be careful because we don't have any other technical dependency here. There's no um, Nginx involved for service discovery. There's no um, console involved. There's no registrator involved or anything. These are just Node.js demons discovering each other. Uh, basically it works on IP broadcast or multicast. Um, so you would obviously need a virtual private network. Um, among these uh, machines, uh, but that's the only thing um, that you need and it's not the responsibility of the software developer, but the actual um, system administrator. So let's see if a validation goes through. Yeah, we have different card IDs and you see this is the payment service and this is the credit card validation uh, mechanism and it basically validates this um, credit card and response to our request. So if, if we want to scale the service, what we do is we just run another um, validation responder, another validation service, and you immediately see that the payment requester here, the payment service here, um, just sees that validation responder immediately and now the requests will be basically load balanced between um, two different validation services. If we need another um, another validation service, we could just launch another one. And now you see, everybody knows that they're online. The last service is also online. And now we'll have validation between three different services. So the best thing is you just deploy your services on a bunch of machines which are connected through the same uh, virtual private network so that the IP broadcast work. Um, and then bam, you have all your services talking to each other. And the good thing is you just define whatever you want. So here in the payment service, we just said that we are a payment requester and we basically require uh, some card validation. And this is the type of my request. I need something um, to validate. That's all. 
I just declare the messages that I want to send. And if there happens to be another service in the ec ecosystem that is capable of responding to that message, to that um, type of request, for example, in this case, it's validate, it just works. So it doesn't matter if you change the name of this to validation or to secondhand validation or whatever. Let's restart this. And there it goes. You don't need to um, update your payment service if you change the name of your uh, validation service or the location of your validation service. It just doesn't matter. Um, so this is actually one of um, the good solutions to the big problems of microservices, the service discovery and service registry and um, their dependencies because your architecture is as good as um, your service discovery uh, mechanism in that sense. So if you eliminate that service discovery uh, with auto discovery mechanisms such as IP broadcast in this case is what code does, um, you basically make sure that um, these services are available and are running on, on every machine on uh, whatever machine you want and they just can talk to each other uh, without any problems or further configuration. Now of course there are some um, deep configuration with within CodeJS. Uh, for example, you might want to limit the, um, the services that can talk to each other because right now this is a mesh network. So whoever joins the network will see everybody else. Uh, you might want to um, limit this communication. And in that case, you could use keys, uh, service keys, which would be a semantic configuration here. Um, so this, for example, let's say, will be about payment. Um, and if you enter the same key here, these services will be able to discover each other and talk to each other and no other services in the network. Um, there are more deeper configurations, um, which I won't um, go into right now. Basically, you can change multicast addresses um, to further uh, prevent um, the communication between, between services. Or you can have environments, uh, which basically lets you deploy test and production or um, QA and different test environments on a single machine and make sure that their um, communication is not um, is not broken due to uh, multiple environments, um, but they are um, the topics of another advanced session about um, CodeJS and microservices. Now I guess we have about 10 minutes left, so I just can't go into the um, e-commerce application, but you can find it on GitHub in um, Code Workshop, and you can basically uh, run it and see how we actually implement um, a payment service, a product service, a purchase service, a user service, um, an admin interface, um, and an end user interface that update in real time uh, with different purchases, purchase orders. Um, so yeah, this is it for, for right now. And basically, I'll be happy to answer your questions um, about microservices and their Node.js implementations. Yeah, we have some questions here. Um, the first one is about Docker. And the question reads, looks like we're mounting the source code as a volume here. What is the benefit of doing so? What if we included the core, the code in the Docker image while we were building it? How are you versioning your source code in this approach? Um, well, there are basically two approaches on how you deploy um, Docker containers. One is bundling the source code in the Docker image itself, and the other one is deploying the source code separately. I prefer this approach of mounting the source code to the Docker image because it basically lets me to build my uh, application 
in a very short time. Instead of building a new Docker image of a new source code and deploying it, like there are a lot of um, problems that are going on. For example, you're using no latest image. Whenever there's a new version, your deployment will have to pull in the new version of Node latest um, when you build a new image. So, like deploying your source code separately gives you the advantage of basically using um, using your um, existing Docker images and just deploying the source code and restarting the Docker image there will basically uh, you'll basically be able to use your new source code. So it's a lot faster like instant deployments um, which which I like. Um, a second question is how does Code.js compare to Seneca.js? Seneca is another framework uh, for building um, distributed applications. Um, the good thing about Code.js is you have no configuration necessary. With Seneca you have to have a server, you have to listen to a port and you have to keep that port numbers. And basically what Seneca gives you is a request response architecture. So you have to build on top of that. With Code.js you have your publisher subscriber pattern and then you have the WebSocket component and basically zero configuration. So um, it's, they are both used for uh, building microservices and then um, Code.js implements auto, um, auto discovery and zero configuration and fault tolerance in that sense uh, over, over Seneca JS. Um, can you reference services across multiple subnets? Uh, well, as long as they are using the same broadcast address um, of of a of another network interface, um, you could. So basically, um, your machines could be um, in in a different subnet, and um, as long as you have a network between them, and and a broadcast address, you could um, use your um, services across um, different subnets. Um, but actually, that's a very good question. Uh, that's a scenario I've never tried yet. So um, maybe we should need we need a demo implementation there. Oh, there's an error in the code. Yeah, I guess so. Um, the next doesn't work there. Um, so how do we run microservices in a platform as a service? Um, the best way to uh, run microservices is by running Docker containers. Uh, if that platform as a service gives you um, ability to run Docker cont containers. If they don't, you don't use them. Um, the good thing about Docker is that you can basically deploy to uh, different machines and different infrastructures. So you can basically migrate your um, deployment from one provider to the other. Um, so, for example, there is a good tool that is called Tutum, uh, which is bought by Docker. Uh, Tutum allows you to deploy and manage your containers um, across, for example, DigitalOcean or AWS, or um, it, they have a policy for bring your own node. You can basically uh, run your own um, cloud installation too. You don't have to buy something off, off of DigitalOcean or Amazon. Um, the good thing is it's basically a click away. You can just migrate your containers from um, Amazon to, uh, let's say, DigitalOcean, and they would all work. Uh, because Tutum also has an internal um, service discovery based on IP broadcast, and it basically lets you um, relieve all your cares about where your um, services live. Um, so as long as you have access to running Docker images in, in a platform, you should go for it. Um, what if the IGMP is not enabled in the network? Um, then obviously this wouldn't work. And basically this is a, a scheme based on IP broadcast. So um, it's for um, special cloud installations and not for regular company networks, I, I presume. Um, so you would have the necessary infrastructure, of course.
Um, can the services be registered on different private networks? Um, yes, but then they need a common private network to basically talk to each other. Um, what if some of the microservices are not written in Node.js? Um, actually, Code.js uses a framework called um, Axon for message transport. And I'm not sure if Axon supports different languages, but I think it was in the roadmap. Um, so as long as, well, it's basically communicating over TCP servers, right? As long as um, there is a um, client library in that language, you could basically communicate through uh, that TCP to token because it's not doing anything special at all. Um, the only thing is that um, there is a TCP socket connection and then some um, little um, code formatting, um, sorry, message formatting on top of that. Um, and probably with um, optional encryption. Um, so if there are no client libraries right now for Code.js in other languages, but um, it's just possible to write some. Uh, is there any project in production that use Code and microservices? Um, of course there are. Um, Uno Gambaha, my company uh, that I'm working right now, we're using um, Code.js in production. And then there are a lot of um, customers um, in, in Turkey. Um, for example, Turkcell is one of the customers who are using Code.js um, for, um, for one of their gamification platforms. And basically, it's serving millions of users um, every day. Um, well, consensus problems, how do you solve consensus problems? Ensuring that there's a, there exists only one instance of a certain service, um, well, that is basically left up to you. Code.js has an internal mechanism for a leader election, um, but it's not exposed to um, exposed as an API that that the um, developers that use Code.js can use. Um, so the idea here is you basically shouldn't need only one service. Um, if you do that, there are some mechanisms for lead election, some libraries also, um, and you should basically implement them on top of on top of Code.js. Um, the approach on API version incompatibilities. Um, basically, you would have a, a request wrapper that would inject um, a API number, API version in each request, and you would send them out um, to the network. You can also use keys for that. The key configuration in Code.js allows you to um, segment your services so that version 1 would use key 1.0, for example, and 1.1 would use another key so that um, basically you don't change your message uh, footprint, message structure, uh, but just change the keys of the services and they point to the, to the new API versions. Um, how do you make sure that a request will be handled and it will be handled by just one microservice? Is there any queue mechanism? Um, right now, there is a built-in queue in the requesters. So when there are no responders available, basically the requester just waits until one gets online and then sends all the, all the requests to uh, that service. So I can just exit all the validation services here and make some pro requests. And then launch a service, a validation service. Oh, I guess I messed with keys here. Yeah. And since we restarted the service. Yeah, there you go. Um, whenever there's a new requester coming into the network, all the uh, requests will be uh, forwarded to that one. Of course, you can have timeouts so that um, 
you can prevent all this instant load happening on a single service. Um, can we see an example of the Nginx configuration? Um, yes, I can show it to you afterwards. Um, yeah, messages basically get queued when no responders are, are available. Um, in development environment, basically, you don't need anything. Uh, you don't even need Docker. You could just um, run these services locally. And that's what basically I do, of course. Um, so here is the payment service. And here is the validation service. And here is another validation service. And it basically runs without any problems at all. So you don't need any, any special configuration when uh, you do development. Um, so about the Nginx config, hmm. how can I get that? I can follow this. There we have the article, and basically here is the um, Nginx template that it uses to um, update the services. And it currently doesn't allow you to use um, virtual hosts. Obviously, you would need to um, implement virtual hosts. It's just listening to um, the default server. Um, if you had virtual hosts on top of this, you'd be able to implement um, many services with just one Nginx installation. And um, yeah, currently this is a simple demo just to show that um, it's doable over um, Nginx. Um, well, you don't actually need all the services. Um, locally, as long as you have a network connection, for example, by sharing the same Wi-Fi or same local network, uh, you could basically um, launch any service on any machine that you would want. Now, this is a problem during development because usually you're at the office and you're sharing the same network uh, with your peers. Um, in that case, we make use of the environment variable to set that, okay, this is my development environment and then my services will not be communicating with my friends services, which uh, uh, incur a lot of uh, problems if they communicate. You know, your requests will be handled by another developer who might be in another stage of development in that sense. So by using environment variables, you basically skip over uh, this problem. Um, currently there, um, the question is, can the queuing be disabled for a given pattern, uh, say for non-transactional services? Um, currently, there is no way to disable queuing, uh, but code is open source, and it would be actually very good if uh, somebody in the audience uh, would take the challenge and implement uh, queuing disability, uh, because obviously it would be uh, useful for a lot of use cases uh, where, where you don't like um, this functionality. The good thing about Code.js is its footprint is very low, so you can just like um, launch tens of a single service and that would make sure that none of the services are offline uh, at any given time. This is what how we achieve high availability with code services. You can just um, launch five of credit card validators even if you need only one uh, because the footprint is actually very, very um, low. So you can launch in different geographical regions for example um, so that even if a data center goes offline, you basically have that um, functionality available. Um, so you don't need to simply uh, disable queuing uh, because 
you almost always know that your um, your requests will be answered. At the latest, you could have, um, well, since PM2 um, relaunches your services and since Docker uh, solutions like Tutum also um, relaunch your service, um, you make sure that at least only one or at least one service will be up and running um, to, to um, basically respond to your queries. You would need the world to end basically uh, to lose any service at all. So I guess we've gone through all the questions, and I would like to thank you a lot for joining us today to learn more about microservices. Um, you can reach me through um, Twitter and email. Um, and we also have a Slack community for Code.js, which you can join, and we can um, talk in depth um, there. And we have the e-commerce application case study, uh, which you can check out and see. Um, thanks for, again, thanks for coming today and listening to me. And thanks, Abdel, for hosting this perfect webinar. <laughs>